I am Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on August 15th, 2018. On this special edition of Called the Coach, we'll spend some time investigating the experience, emotion, and empirical aspects of each element of Gallup's Q12 engagement instrument. And we'd like to know how to increase the power of it in your coaching as a primary driver of success. If you have questions during this webcast, we do have a live chat room that's available for you. Just a peek down there, right below the main video window, if you're on the live page, available. Uh, all you have to do is log into it. Bottom left-hand corner, say log in, choose that button, choose the guest account, take the name out where it says guest, and uh, put your name in and hit submit. You are in, and you can ask us questions live during the program. If you're listening to the recorded version or have any questions about this webcast, you can send us an email, super easy to do, coaching at gallup.com, and we'll get right back to you on those. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com. For all your Clifton Strengths coaching resources and training needs, you can also catch the video in both streaming and downloadable audio for all our uh, for all our webcasts are available. If you're just catching us and we're on Q6 and you want to know where Q1 through Q5 is, they're probably posted to our our coaches blog. Head out there, coaching.gallup.com. Mike McDonald is our host today. He works as a senior workplace consultant here on the riverfront with me, Mike. We just mentioned we haven't like we our offices are literally next to each other. We haven't seen each other all week. So good to see you on Call to Coach. You as well, Jim. You are the oasis in my desert. So it oh, is uh, great man. to be here. How's that, that for a little that is, moment? That is pretty nice. What's <laughs> been awesome, you and I do these webcasts, and then we get a chance to do lunch together, which was actually yeah. something I got to do with Kurt uh, oh, back man. in the day. So I always appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun to kind of debrief together after we do these webcasts and kind of talk about uh, what we said and then kind of look forward to the next you know, the next question. And we spent, I don't know, about 35 minutes together last, huh? uh, last week debriefing. And so it's been, it's been a real privilege to have you on the riverfront to be able yeah, to, to be able to do that. Well, we are talking about question six today. And, uh, you know, I always say this is a really important one. They're actually all really important, but this one's got some special twists to it. I think when we, when we think about engagement and what it can do. And so as we talk about someone at work who encourages my development, Mike, you want to kind of intro that question? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, as we think about this, and we'll, we'll get into some resourcing uh, perspectives for our, our references as we walk through our discussion today. But you're right, Jim. This element uh, really demands a lot of attention. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and say that um, this is the one where this this item I think starts to sort true manager talent versus managers who can follow rules and guidance and instruction. And, and move things at a different level. But I think this, this item here represents uh, the separation of what we would ca categorize or call great manager. Um, and we'll, we'll see the evidence of that in our conversations we move through, but it's, it's a big statement. This item really represents that conversion of, I think, getting work done to getting people done through work, so to speak. And the intentionality behind it just can't be missed. Um, so we want to use tools, right? We want to, we want to integrate lots of tools and perspective as we think about ourselves and uh, our own expertise. So we're always walking through first break all the rules. Uh, the two codes in there, the strengths code, the Q12 code, make sure we're mindful of that and what it represents as a resource. Um, it was great to hear Mike say that he's following through the 12, um, the book 12, The Elements of Great Managing. Um, it's a great book, a uh, nice blend of uh, stories, but also stats uh, behind the mindset of why these items matter and, and how they affect our behavior in so many ways. And then we've tried to be as current and as relevant as we possibly can in the workplace. So we're integrating touch points around what are millennials thinking. If we if millennials are going to represent 70% of the workforce in the year 2020, uh, guess what? That's pretty much right now. And so the wave is about ready to hit the beach. So we better be out in front of it in our own leadership and what's represented with that group. And in always delivering performance through these great conversations. And so the shift there represented in our re-engineering performance management uh, paper that we have released here recently and, and what that helps us understand in terms of what conversations should look like to drive performance. But by bringing that performance in that conversation basis for it uh, into the possession and capability of managers who are doing it with the frequency, the content, and the cadence that they ought to be. Um, so anyway, lots of great stuff as we think about how we can actually deliver on this item. There is someone at work who encourages my development. Uh, Jim, the request here in this, in this element is to help me grow. 
Uh, that's that's the spirit behind it. So that's that's really what we're asking for when we think about this particular item on the receiving end of it. Um, and if we think about the outline, if we walk through that request empirically, emotionally, and experientially, I can't help but think about Don Clifton uh, and his quote as we think about the connection between what strengths uh, represents and how it can cause us to develop as human beings. And, and I've, I've hung on to this quote probably from the first time I I heard him say it, but, um, and I'm sure several in the coaching community have heard this as well, but talent responds best to another human being. And Don, um, professionally and from a research standpoint, and pr probably even personally was able to really grab um, comprehensively what that quote represents, but it, I love what it stands for in the accountability that I can't lead my team by remote control, um, that I have to be an integral part of that. And while on the surface that may feel like it's invading my workspace or a lot of my workspace or a lot of my schedule. Um, I can't escape it. But what we can find is if we can find if we can put a structure through our coaching and the accountability and the call out for what's represented performance wise on the other side, what's represented people wise on the other side, it should be quite motivating for those um, very natural, I think, and gifted uh, team leaders to be involved in these types of conversations. The, the, the talented ones, I think, will be naturally attracted and gravitate towards it. Um, Others who might have to, uh, who may not be quite as natural um, managers, we can still set up defaults and accountability and perspectives that will cause them to be involved in this particular discussion. Um, but you will definitely see a separation around this item. Mike, one of the areas this really kind of speaks to, I, I think, is in this idea of mentoring or in coaching. As we, as we look at some of those talents that are needed to be able to do this as a manager, and I think that's kind of what it's getting at in the question is how am I be, how am I, you know, we talked about cares, someone cares, right? Before, but, but um, it, you know, in this case, um, it, it really is about developing or pushing that person forward in their yeah. progress in their organization, right? What are they doing yeah. to, to do things forward? We know those relationships then have to be a little bit different than it's been in the past with managers. And we have a slide uh, that we're getting kind of famous for. I think it's it's buried in our Straight to the American Workplace report. Yeah. Um, but it gets, talks about this relationship that's changing from the man of how a manager is being seen. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that slide? Yeah, I can because I and I think it's so relevant for this particular item of engagement because this item, um, this whole notion of development, really, really is the hinge. I would say, Jim, that 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 causes the door from the past to future to swing on. And so, if we if we if we walk this out, what we what we see in the past was a predominant focus on pay, um, a singular focus on my role at work, um, what I'm expected to do, a singular focus on um, the relationship that I have with my team leader as one of boss. Um, all of our conversations really were wrapped into one that happened once a year, represented by the annual review, uh, predominant focus on what I shouldn't do and corrective action around not doing things that I'm not good at anymore, um, as well as my job representing um, essentially the explanation for all of my motivation, my purpose, my passion, et cetera. But the shift to future, and this is, you'll hear the tones of this particular item um, that, uh, I'm being encouraged around my development. You'll hear that item. Listen to item number six as it plays out through what the future represents. Mission and purpose. It's not my pay and my bonus by itself. It's more so my mission and purpose. It's not singularly my role at work. It's my development. So right there, we hear that item just straight, um, completely represented. Um, it's not my team leader as a boss. It's my team leader as a coach. So now all of a sudden we see the integration of how as a team leader do I need to be involved with my team relative to their performance if I'm really going to lead through their development and do that, lead to that performance in the right way for that person. And I have to be a coach in order for that to happen. Uh, this audience is perfect to understand and recognize that and bring it out in well-intended team leaders. Ongoing conversations, not just the annual review. And we'll talk about one conversation in particular that really lines up with the developmental need that we have to grow. Um, obvious, obviously a strengths-based perspective as we lead um, teams into the future. And in a shift from 
my motivation uh, and my inspiration and my accountability just being represented by my job now to my entire life, that there's a holistic approach that's being taken. Um, and so we see development really, right? As again, I use that, that metaphor, but it's a hinge. And if team leaders will involve themselves perfectly, that hinge, that door can swing really nice and clean um, as we make that conversion and shift. It's happening either way, Jim, whether we want it to happen or not, but um, our workplace is shifting. And I think our leadership has an opportunity to get out in front of it if we do it right through this particular item. Mike, um, one of the one of the things I think we pin, you know, as we've done this millennials report, we try to pin this thing on millennials. In other words, like, hey, the money, the millennials are driving us towards these this shift. And while yes, I think that it's a generation that happens to be there while this is happening, I don't think anybody, I don't think any boomer or Generation X, whatever you want to do, says, oh no, no, no. I don't want those things. <laughs> you know, they they as well are in the workplace are beginning to see or are wanting or have wanted it. I just think we've matured or the workplace has matured. And I think in the, you know, in the, in the 20 plus years, we've been kind of measuring this in the workplace. We're beginning to get to this point where we're kind of realizing, you know what, humans want these things. Mm -hmm. This isn't it. This isn't necessarily a generational thing. This isn't necessarily a, a, a man or a woman thing. This isn't a race thing. Humans want these things. Yeah. And so um, I, I don't, I, I do want to, you know, just kind of add that in. I look at this, I'm an Xer, and I look at these things, uh, paycheck versus purpose. Uh -huh. Yeah, that applies to me too, Mike. I don't, it, yep. it, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily become a, a millennial thing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I, I, I will say that to a lot of audiences where I'm like, I'll get done reading through that slide and I'm like, I guess categorically, I must be a millennial. I need to go back and, you know, check my birth certificate because I want every single one of those things, you know? And um, so I, I think you're exactly right. And that, that's a true statement, Jim, which you just described. It's it's interesting if we look at it generationally, um, and, and that was a nice lead into this because I think it's quite interesting. But when we think about the importance of that item at any point in a career, um, there's, a nice, there, there's an interesting story. I shouldn't say a nice story, but an interesting story. I want to share it in response to that. Um, the frequency of this particular item uh, actually steadily declines with age and tenure in the organization. Um, so more than half of the employees we've studied in the United States workforce, age 18 to 24, and those less than six months into a new job indicate that someone at work encourages their development. So more than half in that age group and in their tenure, in that tenure, um, indicate that there is somebody who is encouraging their development. But that percentage slips to just 25%, one in four for workers over 55 years of age, uh, and to one in five, 20%, or yeah, 20% for workers with 10 or more years at a particular company. But yet the consistency of our need around that experience and that item, really, it never goes away. Um, so you see that our response to it in our leadership or as an organization or as a culture, we actually are failing to sustain that um, in an ongoing or enduring fashion. Um, and, and we miss it. We miss it all the time. So I think your perspective is right on. Um, we, may, we may change and evolve, and we do change and evolve as people through our tenure, through our experience. But our need and our craving for growth and that mentoring presence and relationship that you're referring to never goes away. So we have to change our approach. Um, in our leadership to make sure that that's, that's still representative of a five. It's still representative of a best practice delivery for that person, regardless of their tenure and or age. Mike, a little off script for just a second, but do you think there is a bias towards uh, this idea of, you know, learning and growing is for, you know, for the new employees, it's for the the students right out of college or the, you know, the, the, the 30 sums, right. But that somehow we, we, when we're 40 or 50 or even 60, that, well, that learning process stops a little bit because we're supposed to know everything or right ever. And I don't think our numbers show that. I mean, I think the numbers show there is a need and a desire just as much for the 40, 50, 60 year olds in, in the workplace as there are for the 20, 30 and 40 year olds. Uh, yeah. Is that kind of what that's saying? I think so. And I think, um, you know, in, 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 if we think about the the reason why, if, if we were to fail in our delivery around this item, it's consistent really, Jim, with what you just described. Um, there's there's three particular facets that would explain it that I think if our coaching should pay very direct attention to when we're thinking about working with team leaders. Um, but first is that there's no cl no clear growth or career plans for our role. So I think it's I think it's easier to notice the new person, right? Um, because there's a novelty effect. And so most organizations do extend resources and, and, um, 
And there's a lot of intentional thought around, gosh, we need to onboard this individual and we need to do it well. How do we do that? Um, but then I, I kind of see we become camouflaged after a while, especially on the other side of that onboarding experience and process, because we're kind of new, but we're not brand new. People have, people start to have become acclimated to our presence. We're not um, asking the same types of questions, but we still have a ton of uncertainty and a lot of turbulence underneath um, our own uh, surface level understanding about our role and what should happen next. What now does career and future look like in that conversation? And this where the, that's where this item really comes in and needs to shift into focus very aggressively uh, on the part of our team leadership. Uh, another facet of where this item misses is that, and this goes back to the intentionality slash talent level of managers, um, but we just need, our managers need to be doing more in their day-to-day -day uh, their weekly, monthly, um, a much more active conversation around progress and development. Um, at some point, if it's if our conversations are singularly around performance and productivity, um, we start doing things because we have to do them, not because we want to do them. And I think that's a key shift around this item, that when we lead through progress and development, it always recasts performance into what, what do I want to do that also aligns with what's valuable and important to clients, customers, and our, um, our own company. Um, so we've got to get managers more involved and hands-on in that regard. And the, and the third, uh, when we just think about our, our entire onboarding to extended career growth process, uh, th th there's a lot of, they're, they're insufficient, they're ineffective. That, that The start may be strong and effective, maybe, but I'm going to qualify that because we know from our State of the American Workplace report that only 12% of the United States workforce would say, that their company does a great job of onboarding. So we've got an opportunity there out of the gate um, and one that still needs to be paid attention to um, throughout our career life cycle. And, uh, but I think you're right, Jim. I think it's, whether we do it well, it's easy to pay attention to a new associate because they're new and there's a novelty about it. It gets harder to your point when we start to know things and assumptions get made about, well, Jim knows what he needs to do. And if he, if he does have questions, he'll come to me. And I'm just going to assume that Jim's career growth and mentoring needs are on its own self-propelled trajectory. I don't need to involve myself in it because maybe at some point from a subject matter expertise standpoint, Jim knows as much as I. But I can't replace, and we'll talk about this later on in our conversation, we can't replace Don's quote, talent responds best to another human being. That's, there's, no, there's no past, present, or future tense around that. That's a very active tense wherever we're at. Mike, this question really builds off, and I alluded to this earlier, really three, four, and five in a lot of ways. Opportunity to do best, recognition, praise and recognition, and of course, someone who cares about me uh, as a person. And we did a little survey asking this question, and this, I think it's one of those surveys where you expect, you know, it's going to go either way, but it was really strong in one direction. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was a really interesting uh, is a really interesting foundation, I think, to this question um, as number six that that um, with growth and development being at stake. And so, yeah, and I think it's important for us to recognize, and, and hopefully, we've seen the story and the chapters of it start to add up. When we think about question three, opportunity to do what I do best, question four, recognition of praise, and particularly question five, or supervisor or someone at work cares about me as a person, think about the foundation and the layers that each of those add to themselves to build up to the authenticity about somebody being involved in my growth, somebody being involved um, in who and how I'm growing encourage, and encouraging my development relationally. And what I appreciate about the, the, the critical mass of that experience that leads up to it, we had, Jim, one time back, this would have been in the late 90s when we were still testing the items, um, figuring out what which ones were those 12 or those those items that were going to be the most powerful predictors of performance. And so when we, when we landed on the 12, we did have a couple iterations where we used it on a one to five scale, right? Strongly disagreed to, strongly agreed. <clears throat> and that was really interesting. And, and so that produced some insight. But then we made a shift and we tried it. We tried one administration where it wasn't on a one to five scale. It was yes or no. So I know it's expected of me at work. Yes or no. I have a best friend at work, yes or no. And so there's a, a whole different psychology mindset, right? The switch is either on or off in our, in our claim about our response to that. So Jim, what really stuck out to me as it, we were thinking about a culture of development and the mutual influence, um, manager-led influence, peer-led influence of each other's development, we, we had one center, it was one of our interviewing centers, there was 169 people, 169 people at that center who went through the Q12, yes or no, and on the item, um, someone, supervisor or someone at work cares about me as a person, every single person said yes. 
169 of 169 said yes. And so, Jim, I get really excited when we think about building out a culture of relationship and authenticity, and it's not a zero sum game. Jim invests in Mike, Mike invests in Jim, and we've got a comfort level with, with knowing that we both win better as a result of that. Uh, it just shifts the whole culture. And I get really excited when we think about how we can tee up items three, four, and five to really drive number six and that opportunity to encourage each other's development. Um, it doesn't have to be a formal program, right? It's just you being genuinely interested in who I am and investing in that. I being genuinely interested in who you are and investing in that. And hopefully that's in that should be provoked and inspired and modeled by our team leader. But we get it. We get a chance to play in that as well in a way that's very meaningful and important. So it just it struck me I was just, you know, what at 169 people when everybody says yes, what isn't possible performance wise? What what claims couldn't they make about what they wanted to aspire or attain um, that would be beyond their reach? And so I think it's anyway, it's a big picture perspective in the accumulation of all these ingredients of these particular four items. Uh, there's a great story to tell that I think uh, really ties back directly to our coaching and its ability to release that culture um, effectively. Yeah, I it, I really love the tie between five and six. As we're, and we're, we're going to we're going to dive into some of the results as we think about six here in just a second. But if it in Mike alludes to this and he says, I would imagine if you don't feel people in the company care about you as a person, this element would feel unauthentic and maybe not work well. Seems mm -hmm. like the elements all build on each other. And, and absolutely, Mike, they, they all do build, right? They're the elements that none of these live in a vacuum. They, they all, they all like strengths, they all build on each other. And so it really, really is one of those situations where if you're trying to develop, but you don't care, that authentic, that unauthenticness can be all you're trying to do is get maximum productivity and just squeeze me for everything that I am. And so there can be that tendency. A good thing when you're coaching managers, a good thing to watch for, like, these are one of those areas where if you, you do, you're running a Q5 lower and a Q6 a little bit higher, I think you got to ask the questions to the to, to staff. How do you guys feel about your development, right? And is it feeling authentic? Because you could be pouring money into development right. and none of it really doing anything for engagement because they don't feel like it's authentic. They may be going through the motions and learning because that's what they need to do. But is it is it really turning or making a difference in the engagement area? Is it changing that absenteeism? Is it, mm -hmm. is it making them safer? Are they looking out for one another? If you know, th that, that can be a big deal. And so you can, on, in this area, you can kind of miss that where, yeah, you can be doing all kinds of training stuff, but if you don't care about them, that could, that could come across, uh, you know, of not being authentic. Yeah. Mike, when we think about some factors that this, let's say Q, back to Q6, as we think about development, really walk us kind of down the path. Where does it affect the workplace and, and where do we see the greatest numbers and what kind of benefits does it have? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jim, you touched on a, a couple of them already, but right now, uh, three in 10 in the United States can strongly agree that there this need for um, uh, development and the encouragement around it is being met. Uh, we see direct correlations to absenteeism. You had mentioned that, but it's interesting too, it really has an overflow into our customer and client relationships. Uh, there's a direct correlation to profit and customer engagement when we do this right. And I think there's a lot of learning and growing if we position people correctly that can take place and right, if we're, if we're smart about it, it's the alignment of that person with the work they do in a way where there's growth on the other side of it. And oftentimes if we do it well, that growth brings a new client into our organization or extends business on through an existing client. And so it's a, a really fantastic way for us to grow our business as we do the right things and growing the individuals within our organization. Um, and it's, it, we have to hit it right. As we think about the peer to peer influence and, and all 12 do represent a team level of involvement. This is one where we, we can't miss and will require some extra involvement on the part of the team leader. Um, that, that notion of mentoring, uh, is a, has a different feel to it if we think about the, the literal definition of mentoring. And it has to be, uh, when we think about that catalytic and role and that ignition role of a manager, this is one where they really have to step in um, and be that catalyst, be that ignition. Um, and so that's, that's one area where it really does challenge, and we'll talk about the structure, it will challenge a team leader to make uh, the value and priority of their time and schedule to where they actually are creating the opportunities for legitimate growth and development. And here's what we know, the, 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 
the power of that being done right is is demonstrated because the fact of the matter is, and this is this is borne out in lots of research, verified in lots of research, but we learn better, we apply what we learn faster, uh, and we develop better when we are impacted and influenced by other people. Uh, there's a lot of science around this, and um, there's a great story in the in 12 the Elements of Great Managing book that we'll we'll talk about later on. But um, it's a strategy. This isn't uh, this isn't an option. This isn't a nice to have feature or a bright, shiny object that we think might be attractive to um, bringing new talent in or having people apply for jobs that we have. These are, this is a fundamental need. And so, um, so as managers, as team leaders, we're coaching those team leaders. They, we have to get them in the mindset that they've got to be able to navigate a career through the strengths-based needs around that developmental item. And so I think it matters from the perspective of the team leader as we equip them, what does development look for look like for Jim, who's got maximizer, communication, arranger, woo, and now we have a language and an understanding and a motivation um, and a motivational kind of uh, an emotional content of who Jim is based on the strengths that he uses. How do we arrange developmental opportunities for Jim that might and probably will look different than Mike, right? So he's ide Mike's ideation, input, learner, achiever, focus. So there's going to be some different things that we orchestrate to really cause legitimate, authentic growth happening for each of those individuals. So we have that advantage, right? So we can coach through team leaders and give them the perspective from that strengths-based lens uh, to really individualize and customize what growth and development looks like. Jim, there's a there's a this is this item represents. Um, a silver bullet of success. Uh, there was when I was when I was reviewing the research around it. Um, there is a real standout awakening that um, and takeaway that if we if we leave with nothing else from a point of conviction or armed with uh, an empirical argument for an audience that we're standing in front of, uh, I really thought this was an important standout. So um, when we look at this particular item. And somebody that I have somebody at work who encourages my development. Nine out of ten employees who report that they have someone at work who encourages their development are classified as engaged. I'm going to pause there and repeat that. Nine out of 10 employees who report having someone at work who encourages their development are classified as engaged. So we're, we win decisively, um, almost unanimously there. One in 10 are not engaged and less than 1% are actively disengaged. So it's it, it, when we talk about, Jim, when you and I led off this conversation about a can't miss item, this is a can't miss item. Our coaching needs to hit this perfectly through that team leader for delivery. Mike, does, does development equal promotion? I think sometimes we think, uh, respond to that. Is, that. is that how it works? In other words, I'm developed and then I'm promoted or how, do, how does that fit together? Yeah, no, it, 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 that's a, it's a great question. I think, Jim, that's, that's a misdirection, uh, kind of a trap door that we fall into. Um, it does not. It doesn't mean that it excludes it, but we're, we're actually leading and growing and developing on past and through the traditional sense of promotion. And I think that's necessary in today's workplace, which is so much um, horizontal, right, than it is vertical. Um, it, we, we have a, it's more of a broadbanding approach, right? So I can earn more money have more impact, yet I'm staying within the sweet spot of my role and extending my influence horizontally. Um, the traditional nature of this vertical, hierarchical, stereotypical shift um, vertically up and down a ladder, um, A, it doesn't exist anymore. And quite frankly, it's kind of artificial. It doesn't represent true growth. Um, true growth really comes, quite frankly, if we're doing it well, uh, it, it's, it's, it's around expectations first and foremost, expectations of who you are as an individual based on your unique talents and abilities and potential for contribution. Um, it's, it's really stimulated and provoked by just a continual effort towards being coached. And Jim, you and I have talked, you know, and, and we're speaking to an audience of coaches, the whole notion of coaching and its literal physical, um, demonstration is, is not to be missed. And so that daily ongoing frequent sidelines, practice, game calling, um, notion of coaching um, is, is what's necessary to bring this item to life. But then there's an accountability. And, and we do want to know, Jim, that um, at some point, right, that um, to some degree, pay, impact, um, recognition, all of those things are ingredients to verify that we are experiencing growth but we have to make sure we have the cart behind the horse. It really is about, am I doing something better? And am I better as a person 
simultaneously than I was before as a result of our involvement with each other. So yeah, it's interesting. And I think if we, if we, we, if we get the pay piece right, we don't have to ignore it or completely do away with it. Um, but it's certainly not the leading factor. It would be, uh, it would be something that might happen along the way or an indicator that growth is happening, um, but certainly not something that we would lead to singularly. Mike, we spend a lot of time kind of focusing on the manager because I think we think it's important, right? I think we think the impact uh, really, uh, if we if we can make a, a movement, a change, an impact on a manager that can have a down a downstream or a side stream, however you want to say it, uh, effect on, on the entire team. But development ha- does have some responsibility built to it by the individual. So yeah. say I'm coaching individual contributors. And I'm I'm kind of walking them through. They've a, they've answered this question, or I'm a coach. How would I kind of get to the heart of this individually for those individual contributors yeah. and say what like and what's their responsibility in this? Yeah, no, that's excellent. Well, and I think what's important about the the perspective right there in your question, Jim, is the fact that we write our process around engagement, our team leaders of engagement should eradicate the ability for any of us to be victims, right? and in fact have a sense of ownership um, and involvement around what engagement looks like for us. So we get to join in and and be involved in our own engagement with our team leader, um, with our coach. But we do see that this element in that story decisively, it's one of the four that we see most responsible for moving individual contributors up from one tier of engagement to another. And so that's an important part of our perspective, right? That if we really wanna see a sizable shift in an individual and roll up to a shift in a culture, um, if we hit someone encourages my development correctly, it's one of the four that really makes that shift as decisively as others. And, and strategically, if we think about team leaders or Jim, if you're coaching someone directly, the really nice play to that is if somebody does, if they're actively disengaged or if they're not engaged, is really helping to have them really become a, their own performance consultant or their own team consultant. And so if there are things that represent gaps or things that are disconnected in terms of what would produce an ideal work environment or opportunity to perform, by all means, let that individual identify it, but then let's let's collaborate and problem solve around it. And then the resolution of that or the solution um, that's being provided, if it, that person can be put in a position of ownership around it. So now they've identified the gap but they also now can own and become the solution to the gap and represent that and benefit their team, benefit themselves, but also probably learn a lot about themselves in the stretch around that solution. And so they're certainly motivated by it. There's certainly emotion underneath it, but it's a really great natural way for us to become the solution to the problems and the gaps that we identify that matter to us. Um, But we grow as a result of that as well. And it just shifts that whole dynamic. It's what I love about the interplay of strengths and engagement is again, it just removes that that victim mentality where we could easily put it on our team leader or we could start to blame the organization for what we don't have. And the repositioning because of that strengths and engagement lens really, um, it changes the entire experience to one where now it's it's a gap and in, instead now it's growth, you know, is response. Yeah, and I don't know if we we didn't necessarily intend in the word someone to be ourselves, right? right? But I I think there we, we also have to say no one looks out, and I tell I tell my interns this all the time. Nobody looks out for your career like you do, That's and awesome. so you have to make sure that you're you're spending some time with those. As a coach, you get the opportunity to coach these individual contributors, that their focus on their development is just as important as what their manager is doing, mm-hmm. and so and it, and it doesn't end, and it has to keep going. I, I, you know, I think about what we've developed here at Gallup around these webcasts that we're doing right now, and it's just as much my responsibility to make sure I'm developing myself in these roles. I also help manage the process, but I have individual contributions like I'm doing right now, right? This is a, I'm contributing individually. How do I get better at that? Well, it doesn't happen because my boss tells me to do it. It happens because I listen to my own webcasts, which is super scary, by the way, <laughs> uh, all the time. I go back and review and like, could I have done this better? Mike, we meet together and I, you ask me and I ask you, what could we do better? What, yeah. what could, what could, how could I have uh, I've grown? I see that as an as as much of an engagement index as what my manager is doing for me. Yeah. And if I've quit, then I've really got to ask myself, like, am I accepting those opportunities to to learn and grow in that organization? And if I'm not, maybe I need to move on. You know, yeah. maybe I need to do something different. Yeah. Um, so I I really do want to bring that because we emphasize sometimes the managers just get hammered 
in this particular area. And it is absolutely their responsibility to make this available in organizations. Yeah. But it takes two to tango, yeah. right? And so individual contributors also need to step up and be as concerned about their own professional development and, and continue to work that as well. So yeah. we anything anything else you want to add to that before we move on? No, I, I just I do I love the the positioning of that, Jim, because I, I I think it's you're right. I always think about the um when we when we as individual contributors own our own engagement, we actually if we want to and we do it right, we can invite our team leader to the conversation, right? Um, a well-intended team leader ought to be creating the space for these conversations to happen. But to your point, Jim, that may not always optimally be available. And so there's going to be an ebb and a flow sometimes for our team leaders demand. Um, but, but the best team leaders, the right team leaders will always respond to that invitation. And so I, I would encourage all of us as individual contributors in those moments where we are, um, we know the premium around this item. We know our own need around growth and development. And there's nothing wrong about um, if it's if it's been a little bit of a, a time lapse between having that active conversation for us to send out the Outlook calendar invite and just say, hey, I'd like to, these are some things I'd like to talk about. That's a great way for us to own our own engagement and bring this um, to your point. It's a mutual extension. It's a mutual agreement. And boy, team leaders love it. I mean, they just love it when they, you know, when we cut them a break like that. And, and um, it's not a guilt trip it's not it's not anything like that but it's just an extension of the relationship right this is a collaborative thing and it's an ownership piece that i think um, we have the opportunity to take advantage of no you mike you said team leaders love that and as a manager man i there is nothing better than when i have a what you know somebody come to me and say hey i am i was worried about this i am taking care of it like that um wow then all of a sudden my engagement as a manager goes up mm -hmm. because you know, the, I, I'm seeing the investment they're making into their own career, into their own skill set, into their own team, you know, the skills they'll bring to the team to help make the team better. And so we, we absolutely, and, and I, I really think managers who play that dual role where they're managing and individual contributors, man, you cannot miss on that on that space. You got to be able to do both, right? I'll, I'll jump up on a pedestal in reaction to what you just said, Jim, because I think that, um, I think that's a sign of really great leadership too. I think team leaders are scanning the horizon of their team and they're looking for those individuals that can own, um, you said it, right? Nobody can own your career like you do, but I think that's a great sign of leadership. I think people who can own their own careers may have a predisposition or a wiring to be a little bit more aware of others' careers and being able to lift uh, and support those as well. I think there might be a peripheral um, acknowledgement or a, awareness around that, that, that that may be somebody who doesn't, who might, do a pretty good job of leading a team themselves if they have if they had that kind of perspective uh, to begin with. Yeah. We have some team leader insights that we want to get to. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, I, I get really excited about this because <clears throat> this sounds really, this can be fairly ambiguous and um, hard to get our arms around. And I, I love the value of our re-engineering uh, re performance management paper. And I would encourage you all to take a look at that if you have it, because it does really translate. It takes engagement and strengths into literal physical structures of conversations. I, was, I get really excited about one of the five conversations that uh, was revealed in our performance development approach uh, that is committed to this notion of developmental coaching. It would actually, is the, in, in the layout of our five conversations, this would be the fourth conversation, and it's just simply titled developmental coaching. Now, this conversation, what it represents is, is its, its direction when an employee takes on a specific project or when they're exploring career aspirational or developmental opportunities. So, so you can see what, what's represented in that conversation, how consistent it is with this particular item. And when it's positioned right, it really does put that person uh, right in the space of connecting a project and assignment to a need where the company and the team moves forward in filling that need, but so does the person in their own development. And then you as the team leader, you need to establish a cadence on a monthly basis for about 30 to 60 minutes where you're going through and you're reviewing, hey, how is the project coming along? But what are you learning about yourself in the midst of its delivery? Uh, where are you struggling? Where are you succeeding? Where's some discovery about uh, your own strengths? Where's discovery about your own leadership and your ability to influence other people in its delivery? And, um, and, and what's unfortunate, Jim, when we see this conversation, it's not so much a how are team leaders or organizations delivering this conversation? Unfortunately, it's really a question of, are they even having these types of conversations at all? Um, so really for every single person on our team, we ought to be 
having these developmental coaching conversations because we've actually put that person in a position to have some developmental learning opportunity through a project or assignment that's unique to their own learning and growth. Um, so we need to be mindful of that. And I, and I think that on the other side of that, the miss, the miss um, that that conversation really allows us not to have is that when we look at this notion of mentoring and we look at um, somebody encouraging our development, sometimes we can over prescribe the structure and the level of detail and the rigor around what that looks like. And that really true authentic relationship mentoring and encouraging and development um, really resists that kind of stifled um, environment. And so a lot of the best practice deliveries in terms of mentoring is might be a, a conversation that's oriented around maybe a scavenger hunt list of outcomes, but with no prescriptive, no prescriptive steps or order to how that mentor and mentee actually arrive at those outcomes and allowing there to be some life and some, some um, breath to, to be able to take place in terms of that relationship and what that delivery feels like. And, and typically what's happening is well, you know, how many well-intended organizations have tried to construct these really fantastic, elaborate mentoring programs, but they just, it's just sand in the gears and they just grind along and they never really deliver in the way they were intended. And that's really what's happening there is, is that we're just stifling um, and strangling the, the, the life out of those, um, the real natural experience in the relationship that mentoring actually represents. And certainly that item represents its, it's in its delivery. It's, um, it's interesting, as you mentioned, mentoring, we've got some interesting data around where that matters when students are in college. And you know, you know, we know their success, their future success really lies in the fact of whether they had a mentor when they were in school or not. And I think we miss this when when we when we hire them afterwards, whether it's an employee who's 22 or 52. I feel like we miss the mentoring in the enterprise these days. Like we we don't we kind of think, well, you're on your own. And um, I think we could think through and have some more healthy mentoring relationships. I, I, in my own case, I, I've got a lot of great mentors, you included, Mike, and as part of Likewise. For, for me as part of this program that I do with you and with Dean and with Micah, right? There are mentoring roles in there where I didn't know any of this stuff. Five years ago, I was an IT manager, right? I didn't know any of this stuff. You and I were talking the other day. You know. yeah. I think I've, I should have a master's degree in the number of hours that I spent talking about strengths and engagement and everything else, uh, you know. Um, but it, we almost lose that. And I, I, I think um, it, as we can, as coaches and even as managers, we can kind of think through, I think we can get a lot of developmental lift, some yeah. best practices by implementing, and it, you don't have to call it mentoring, but by, by, by thinking through the mentoring concepts and, and implementing those in a way where those more experienced are able to work with those that are least. In my recruiting role, I hear all the time, oh, we don't have enough time for that. Mm -hmm. And you, you listen, you don't have enough time not to develop the future. Like that will crush you 100 out of 100 times. Right. right? You just, you can't, you have to always be thinking, I've got to find ways to carve out time to bring the future forward mm -hmm. with, with, with those who are coming in. It's not an age thing, by the way. It's like, it's a skills and experience and strengths thing. Yeah. And if we're not carving that time out, I think mentoring is a way to get to that. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a secret weapon of this, of this question, by the way. Yeah, I love it. You know, and Jim, here's, here's the accountability and we, we are just, we are wired for this. Like this is, again, this is not an option and it's not something that um, is a program or a training. This is just the way human beings are wired. And I got really excited. There's a great story um, in our 12 elements of great managing book that, that I think really brings an accountability to our perspective on this. Getting back into neuroscience and, the, and there's a, a, a reference to some research um, about the discovery of mirror neurons. Um, and so in, in this research, when we think about mentoring and modeling, um, and, and I'm going to make a direct connection between um, praise and recognition in the past seven days to someone encouraging my development. I want to, I want to do that right now. But in this research, they were actually, they had a, um, they had, uh, were monitoring brainwave activity in some monkeys that they were studying. And essentially they were just trying to look at what, what 
parts of the brain were lit up when uh, these monkeys were involved in physical efforts, such as picking up a banana or a raisin or, or something along that line. And so when they, and they, when they would, when these monkeys were physically involved in these activities, they were, you know, they had a, an ability to measure what was going on, what part of the brains were activated when that was happening. Well, by accident, they, as they were monitoring the brainwave activity in these monkeys, they noticed that if the monkeys actually observed one of the researchers doing something um, that, that actually modeled physical activity. So if the researcher was doing something like eating an ice cream cone or punching in uh, buttons on their keyboard or so on and so forth, that that same area of the monkey's brain would light up as well. And so there was an absorption, right? So Jim, if I'm around you, and here's what this means to us. If I'm around you and you're an eloquent, gifted speaker, you've got this communication strength that you've honed, um, you have an innate ability for it, and you've honed and practiced it over years in a variety of environments, I start to model and pick up that to the best of my ability. Now, it's not going to be the same as you, but I can start to absorb a little bit of that influence from you. But there's a modeling and a mentoring effect that physically takes place and influences my own development um, as I grow as a person. And literally, if you play this out, it, it, it's, it's why, have you, ever, have you ever noticed, Jim, when somebody yawns, then you yawn as well? Um, and think about newborns, right? When they stick their tongue out or when we stick their tongue out at them, they stick their tongue out as well. And it's those mirror neurons that really are explaining that, that reactive behavior, but the influence that modeling has on it. So here's the connection I think, Jen, that really works so well. When we think about bringing a culture to life and animating it through recognition and then thinking about how do we display and activate other items of engagement, such as encourages development. When we identify these best practice people and recognize people for where they're at their best, we now have a living, breathing model of engagement in front of us. We visibly now recognize what their behaviors, actions, decisions, uh, words are representing around that item. But our mirror neurons, right, are kicking in. And there's a mentoring effect that takes place there in that physical proximity and the recognition of what that real best practice delivery looks like. So, Jim, again, as I think in our own expertise, the, as we get more adept and more credibility, we should start seeing intentional connections between elements of engagement and how we lever and use them to drive each other um, in, in a much greater multiplier effect than, than individually. But I do like this. Again, I love the accountability. While I, I, get, I get excited about the recreational aspect of the story of the mirror neurons and how they were discovered, the call to action around it is this is an inescapable truth. We are wired this way. So therefore, there's no other way that we can get around the delivery of it. So Anyway, Jim, just a, a, a call to action, I think, for all of us as we think about our own delivery. Yeah, in the final minutes we have here, let's, let's get really practical. I think yeah. we've got some advice on some conversations, some mm -hmm. questions we should be asking in these conversations. Yeah. And then we've got some best practices uh, that we want to share as well. And so, Mike, let's dig a little bit into those conversations and then best practices. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, by our own application, our own practice around this item, um, the best questions, if you're working with a team leader, the best questions a team leader ought to be asking themselves is, do I understand which developmental opportunities are most important to each member of my team? Do I understand which opportunities are most relevant to my team members' career goals? Have I created shared goals and established expectations with my team. And then going back, Jim, to my previous commentary around recognition, do I regularly celebrate my employees' successes and achievements? And I'm gonna pause there because again, I think that's why recognition matters so much because we need a gauge. We need, to, we need to know that we've made an advance, that we've made progress. And so a lot of times encouraging my development does require a marker, right? You, uh, Jim, what was your term you called it? Was it a, an Ebenezer? Yeah, an Ebenezer. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. an Ebenezer, a milestone, right, that we pause and say, Mike, you've really come a long way. Or Mike, this, this didn't come as far as we thought it would. What are the barriers that we could work together to remove? So key questions that ought to be asked uh, that the manager really needs to hold themselves accountable to. When we think about great conversations that managers can, can activate to, to bring that encouragement and that development to life, um, really tapping into, obviously, what do they enjoy most about their work? Is there something that they're just naturally in tune with that we can build off of? Um, where are the challenges? And not bad challenges, but where they feel like there's an edge and a stretch and a growth and still an attraction uh, to that activity. Um, I really love this question in particular because I think it starts to get down to the peer influence, the, the team perspective about how we mutually encourage um, growth and development for each other. But asking your team, what are ways that we can or that we are developing as a team? 
um, and what are ways that we as a team could activate that we could involve ourselves with to advance uh, our own involvement and development um, individually. Uh, best practices, some of our best. Uh, it really, there's an accountability around encouragement and development that matters. And I mentioned it earlier, but it really is providing not a strangled structure that um, stifles the relationship in the midst of that mentoring uh, and development process. But, but what are some key milestones and markers that will indicate where we want to go and when we actually got there. And there really should be to some level or another, right? Whether it's a banana or not, some, some sort of acknowledgement that we've actually arrived and, and that matters and that starts to make sense out of our growth and development. Uh, another trap door, but what the best don't miss on is they never look at development as a finished product. And Jim, I think that goes back to that career tenure or maybe that age perspective where we start to make inaccurate assumptions about the fact that, well, Jim's been here for a while and he's at a certain age, so he's got he's on his own. Those questions are all answered for him. And if he needs anything, he knows how to do it all himself. Um, but development is never done. There's a lot of small, um, small finish lines in between, but there's never any one big complete finish line. So we've got to continue to move that on out. And I think that's, that's a key one for managers to, to, to easily miss and fall uh, through that trap door. And we really should celebrate it. There's something, right? We know that there's something emotionally that captures us when we have a celebration around it. What gets recognized gets repeated. And so if we want to really propel momentum out of that accomplishment, that growth and development, we really should pause and have a space where we, where we have a, an acknowledgement that something great was accomplished and happened. And Jim, to, to the to the narrative and the theme of so much of our conversation today, we really should go back and re-examine um, our long-serving employees, those that have been around for a while, those that we may have been making um, some accurate assumptions based on their capability and their tenure. Mike, back in April, we published a blog, uh, April 12th of 2018, if you're listening to this any other year. Um, it's called Why Managers Must Ask Five Questions to Empower Employees. Um, Eduardo, I think yeah, Eduardo uh, had put that in the chat room, uh, really, really important. It highlights for me the importance of staying close to Gallup.com for a lot of this material that we have out there. Um, I, I say as a resource manager for our coaches that it's probably the best kept secret among our coaching community. Uh, of all the, I get asked questions all the time from our coaches and 99% of the time it's been covered in a post that we've done out there. But Mike, uh, you, you said you alluded to many of these, but you know, questions like, do you know what you can do well that you haven't done yet? And I love that question. Like, wh where are we missing with you? Like what, uh, what opportunities are there that you've seen that we haven't seen yet? And, and as a manager, that gives me the opportunity to really kind of dig into the heart of, hey, what are you thinking about? Or what kind of problems do you think you can solve that I haven't implicitly asked you to solve yet? Um, you know, what are you thinking about? And I think you'll find your most engaged employees are thinking about those things. They just didn't know they had permission to be able to do it. Yeah. And, and so I, I think there's some great opportunities. Head out there. If you just search for those five conversations or five questions, for managers, uh, you can find that at gallup.com and there's some great stuff out there as well. Mike, um, as we as we kind of bring this in for a landing, final thoughts yeah. on Q6? Yeah, there, I do have a, a capstone that I wanna put on this because it, it, it really does represent this item and uh, where it's done well, but the, the mistake that's made along the way. And so when we think again about the true notion of, of mentoring or encouraging growth and development, uh, we, we see so much Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, but we see so much attempts at structure and rigor and a programmatic nature to it. And the there's an overload of that. And so, you know, it doesn't matter how big the training manual, it doesn't matter how elaborate or fancy the blended computerized knowledge management systems are that are intended to bring people through that process. Um, there's nothing that's going to beat the way we just experience work as human beings, and that's through social activity. That's through meeting social needs and that there's responses um, that we are uh, providing to other people. There's responses that they're providing to us. Um, and those are necessary collaborations in our relationships to really, truly, genuinely learn, but then on the other side of learning to actually apply what we've learned. And we just have a fundamental need as humans for connection and cooperation. Uh, we've talked a lot about support and trust and even that, that sense of belonging that's just so integral to learning. And I think one of the mistakes and I know that I made this in, in some of my early efforts to create certification programs for people on my team is I would come up with these really robust 
uh, learning interventions, but they were all done in isolation. So it was go read this and fill out, you know, this worksheet or have a response that you create your own learning journal from, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it really dawned on me, um, uh, where I was like, you know, I'm cutting somebody off from the most rich source of learning that they're going to have, which is another person. And so I'm now I'm very intentional about making sure that learning has a blend of, you know, some introspection where a person is by themselves, but depending on their strengths, you know, to what's the bandwidth they need that they need to be with other and learn with other people. And so I'm very intentional about that. And so I think that's a real key takeaway. Our research would tell us that our application would tell us that my personal experience would certainly confirm it that we have to learn and do learn best together. But the problem is, is that too many people still see our organizations as the makeup of people as machines, right? That we're, we're individual units that just snap on and connect to each other without that, leg that legitimate and genuine relationship thread. So I would just encourage us all not to, it, it's, it's great to create these great learning experiences, but keep them loose and make sure that there's a space for that genuine relationship to, to arrive at those outcomes together um, in what's represented. Mike, a learning moment for me during the session today, uh, as we were talking, I realized, hey, I have not set up my fall one-on-ones for our interns. Like they, during the summer, we had set up regular times to meet. And then of course, schedules change in the fall and you have to adapt. And I had yet to send that note that said, hey guys, uh, I'd like if, and I, I let them kind of determine how often they want to meet with me. If it's weekly or every other week or once a month, I kind of let them set the pace at, at how, what they want to share with me. But it was an important reminder that I'm not going to get these co development conversations if I don't ever see them. Right. And, and with interns, it's particularly hard because they're only on campus maybe five hours a week mm -hmm. uh, at best. And uh, and so we have to be very, very intentional about reaching them. And it's it's not easy, And it, but that's not an excuse. Like right. you can't just, like, oh, well, it's hard. <laughs> um, so those are some things you gotta do. We have some resources yeah. that we wanna remind everybody uh, that's that's out there listening um, that are available for you. Mike, can you kind of cover those? Yeah, certainly. So we love uh, bringing, bringing our discussions to a conclusion with, with a lot of reference to uh, useful opportunities for each of you, right? Areas where you can expand your own coaching and your expertise. Uh, the, the first one I'll mention is our engagement champions course. Uh, this course really uh, involves a coach getting into the expertise, the science, the research behind engagement behind the 12 elements that we're walking through right now, but what's represented um, in the outcomes and more importantly, how do you coach and lead to it? How can you create a system and a structure that delivers engagement uh, at an organizational level, at a team level, at the individual level, you become a true engagement master. The resources around it uh, are quite profound. Um, there's a lot of coaching questions that are involved in there, uh, questions that you can coach team leaders through, questions that team leaders can coach their teams through. Uh, so it really puts you at the dashboard, uh, again, of mastery and consultative advice around engagement that's really powerful and necessary to activate engagement um, for any audience. The other, uh, the other course we'd like to reference is uh, leading high-performing teams. If you wanna get inside the world of a team leader and understand what that looks like uh, through their own leadership, their own strengths-based leadership as an individual leader, how they lead their team through this collective strengths of their team, how do they lead through strengths and through that lens of engagement to understand what culture and environment at the team level looks like, and then on into performance, right? We've talked a lot about re-engineering performance management into performance development and the needs that are represented in that shift there. All of those things are represented in that leading high performance, leading high performance teams course. And then we, we have another resource. If those two uh, courses uh, don't line up with your schedules um, and you want to get started more quickly, we do have an engagement starter pack. And that has that book, First Break All the Rules, with the two codes inside. Uh, it has creating an engaging workplace manager packet inside of it. So the lots of tools and resources that are relevant and relative to the role of a manager and how they would activate engagement within their team, uh, engagement discussion cards, and then even um, my discussion question cards, those that can be used to really help that team leader think about who they are as a leader and how they call that out in the performance of their team. So Jim, lots of options for people to use uh, as we continue to involve and hone our craft as coaches and extend it onto um, helping others create leadership and growth through engagement. Well, my, Mike said in the chat room, he's excited to go to the uh, the Engagement Champions course in Chicago yeah. coming up in That's September. Awesome. That's awesome. And so uh, those are available, courses.gallup.com if you wanna see what's available in your area. 
during whatever time you're listening to this. Mike, thanks again. We're halfway through. Amen. Yeah, I know. Six down, six to go. Six down, six to go. It. Not yeah. quite as daunting as 34 themes that <laughs> right. it does with me, but uh, still uh, lots of material. Think about that. Six hours of learning uh, that people have on Q12. We'll do six more for the, for everybody out there listening. And we've appreciated your feedback. If you... You know, if you if something's working, if you want to add something into the program, if you want to get that to us, you can you can send it just directly to me if you'd like to do it. Jim underscore Collison at Gallup dot com. The best way to get those in. We love to hear your comments. It's gotten this series has gotten as much positive feedback as when we launched Theme Thursday, which has mm -hmm. been our flagship webcast now for a few years. Does well over half. Here's a little stat for you. Theme Thursday, we have the whole network. So Theme Thursday called the coach, a bunch of different versions in Spanish, the Gallup podcast, all those on our network. Um, Theme Thursday does half of all those downloads wow. each each wow. and every week, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but we are getting good reviews on this, Mike. So let me mm -hmm. publicly encourage you. Uh, your development of people in this in this manner is making a difference. So I appreciate you. No, I love it. Jim. Doing that. It's bringing out the, the best of uh, me for sure. And in, in, in all of our learning. So I'm, I'm really happy to share it. This yeah. is a great conversation. I look forward to it every week. It's terrific. It, you know, if you want to see some fun stuff though, go search for our great manager stuff that Mike and I did like four years ago <laughs> as we, that was our first attempt really to launch yeah. something like this. And, yeah. uh, and, and we did about 13 of them and, that really morphed into this. So anyways, mm -hmm. Mike, appreciate your effort. Yeah, we'll remind you. everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available at the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com. Send your questions or comments. Uh, you, I mentioned that earlier, my address, but if you want to send in general questions, you can send them to our coaching email address, coaching at gallup.com, great way to do it. You can catch the recorded audio and video of this program as well as all the past ones are available on our social resources page at the, at the coaches blog. Just go to coaching.gallup.com and click on the resources tab. If you're interested in becoming a Gallup certified strengths coach or getting any information on our courses that are available, Mike mentioned too, they're on our courses page. Just go to courses.gallup.com. You can navigate right to those as well. Uh, uh, we want to thank you for joining us. If you want to join us in our Facebook group for to continue the conversation, you can do that as well. Facebook.com slash group slash called to coach. We'll get you there. I want to thank you for coming out today and giving us an hour of your time. We'll be back next week, I think, with question seven. And that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.